I have on the screen today our first article, and it basically what what I wanted to cover today is is what does trustless mean? Well, trustless is defined by Merriam-Webster as not deserving of trust. In the blockchain space, it means something entirely different. Trustless in the blockchain industry simply means you do not need to place your sole trust in any one stranger, institution, or other third party in order for a network or payment system to function. Trustless systems work to achieve consensus mainly through code, asymmetric cryptography, and protocols of the blockchain network itself. The trustless environments that blockchains have created enable peer-to-peer -peer sending and receiving of transactions, smart contract agreements, and more. So what, what we're really talking about is, is instead of going to a trust company to do, your re to do your real estate transaction and having those people make sure that the, that the money for the down payment is in escrow from the buyer and that, that um, the buyer is qualified and has the mortgage in place and ready to purchase the property and that the, the mortgage that you have that you're going in selling the house that gets paid off, that all those values are accurate and all the information is put together. Instead of having a company or an, a person in the middle there, making sure this transaction all comes together, um, we're transferring that trust instead to programmers who have programmed all of those rules and the information into a smart contract or into a the blockchain logic. So really when we talk about trustless, we're really talking about a transfer of trust. So um, the next question comes down here is, whom do you trust? You know, we put trust as a critical role in our personal finances. You know, we might, we deposit our money in a bank and expect the, the money to be there when we uh, want to withdraw it. In fact, not only do we expect it to be there when we want to withdraw it, we want the bank to pay us a little bit for having used the money in, in the meantime. When we go to a stock brokerage or a company that we buy and sell our stocks through, we expect that the, the fiduciary, the person responsible, will take our money and do with that money what we expect. Well, when we talk about decentralized applications, we're literally talking about transferring the trust of a stock brokerage firm and your stock broker, transferring that trust to coding that would be totally done automatically as soon as we give our money to that entity and give it instructions as to what to do with that money. So where we're putting our trust really is shifting and instead of having those people type intermediaries that make sure that even though we haven't met the person that's buying our house, that the money is going to be there when we sign on the dotted line and say, yes, we're going to relinquish our house and sign over the documents and sign over the title deed, that that, that intermediary is going to make sure that our mortgage gets paid off and that we get whatever's remaining after the mortgage is paid off and all of that stuff. So basically, if we're talking about cryptocurrencies, there's a trust versus a trustless type of crypto situation too. You're familiar with Bitcoin, okay? You expect that when you buy Bitcoin, you're gonna get a certain amount of Bitcoin. It's usually a portion of a Bitcoin, unless you can afford the, you know, the $30,000 that one Bitcoin costs today. So when you send a transaction over the Bitcoin network, you expect it to be processed. And if you're purchasing something with your Bitcoin, you expect the other person to get their Bitcoin and the product to be sent your direction. It, here, here's kind of a situation. You know, we we always hear about the, you know, the Nigerian prince who, you know, wants to get his throne back. And uh, if you'll just help him to hold his money for a little bit, you'll be able to cash in on a hundred thousand dollar, on a hundred thousand dollars once he gets his crown back and gets hold of his money, and he'll gladly pay you. And it'll only cost you five thousand dollars to to buy into this. And the minute he says, you'd have to pay $5,000, you immediately says, ah, time out. Um, me pay you so that you can get your throne back so that I can get my $100,000 back. Well, 
we all know that that's pretty much a scam. And so we don't pay our $5,000. But what if it were in a crypto trustless smart contract? And you knew that in the smart contract that the Persian prince was really who he said he was. And in fact, the Persian prince did in fact have that two hundred that hundred thousand dollars that you were gonna get paid sitting there ready for it if you'll just pay your five thousand dollars. Oh, I I'd love a you know twenty times investment where I pay five, get a hundred back. That's cool. But because there is no intermediary and you don't trust the Persian prince without a trusted intermediary in between, you don't do the transaction. Maybe you lose out on 100000 Probably just don't lose the $5,000. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about with the cryptocurrencies and smart contracts and the environment that the trust uh, is developed in. You trust the coding to identify that the person on the other side is a, a trusted individual and has what they say is going to happen. So here we can talk about two different ways of dealing with things. There are two types of wallets when you deal, deal with cryptocurrencies. One is a non-custodial wallet that I have highlighted on the screen here. And you have a custodial wallet. So if you go to Coinbase or Gemini or any one of a lot of different exchanges out there, it's kind of like going to the stock exchange or a stock broker. They act as an intermediary for you. Actually, they hold the public key for your wallet and it's what they call a custodial wallet. In other words, they're custodians of your wallet. In that case, it's really not a trustless wallet. It is a you know, you are trusting the custodian just like you would trust a bank. So in that way, a lot of people are just a whole lot more comfortable dealing with a Coinbase or a trusted exchange rather than, um, rather than having their own wallet because a non-custodial wallet requires you to keep the password available, keep you the, all the pass keys available, all the pass phrases. If you lose them, you lose your money. So, you know, there's all sorts of stories about the Canadian man who, who passed away and most of his, most of his wealth was in his private wallets, his non-custodial wallets. And the people who were executing the will, it said in the will that he had all this money, but they couldn't find the public or private keys. So they could never get to the money and they tried every machination they could. And from what I understand, they recovered some, but not, not nearly um, the total of what was in his, his wallet. Um, and, and I've got a comment here that some trusts like Mount Gox aren't so trustworthy. Well, and that, that is true too, because when you're dealing with a custodial wallet and a custodian like Coinbase or any of the other exchanges out there, you have to be able to trust them. And Mt. Gox was one of the very early exchanges and they, um, they ran afoul with um, the hackers out there and had most of the coins stolen from them and never recovered. So that was in the early days of uh, crypto. We've gotten more mature. The coding has gotten more mature since then. They're more reliable today than they were, you know, five, six years ago when Mt. Gox happened. But you're right. That brings up the point that if you just choose to have a custodian of your wallet, you have to be able to trust the custodian. So then there are what they call decentralized exchanges. They're, they go by the term DEX, D-E-X, and for decentralized exchange. Um, one of the big examples of that is Uniswap. It is a decent, it's a coin used in a decentralized exchange to swap the different, what they call ERC20 tokens. ERC20 tokens are a, are a standard of token that's created on the Ethereum blockchain. So when you have on Ethereum, you can build these distributed or, or decentralized finance systems and decentralized exchanges what means what it means is there is no person 
on the other end of that exchange at all. You're totally relying on the coding within that blockchain. Now, what, what that does mean though, is that with no coding there, um, let's say you want to make a transaction. In order to make a transaction, what a DEX does is it has you put up the coin or the money that you want to exchange for whatever other money and the other person who is who is also exchanging has to put up that money when both of the sides of the transaction are there then the transaction is completed so if the one side or the other doesn't get uh, deposited in the smart contract what then happens is the money just gets returned to the user so uh, in that way the coding just makes sure that both people have what money they committed to the to the trade let's say i'm trading ethereum um ethereum tokens of uh, bat for example the the uh, tokens that brave the brave browser gives out when you look at their ads and you you work with them uh, and i'm exchanging it for uh let's say um the token that is used in um the coin app what token is that well, the coin app is a, is a, a geo coin and it's also an ERC token. And if I wanted to exchange a bat for an ERC token for what they call it coin, in order to exchange those two, they'd have to make sure both of those were in the contract. And once both were in, I could exchange my bat for my coin or his coin or what vice versa and be able to do that uh, swap. And that's the way uh, decentralized exchanges work so you know i highlighted a little bit on decentralized finance uh decentralized finance uh run the gamut from getting loans putting up money ah xyo thank you um xyo is the coin that i was referring to that to get swapped for bat so what you have is um different finance systems on a smart contract that can you can get loans for you can deposit money and most of them have people who want to earn money so they deposit just like they do in a bank when you deposit money into a savings account in a bank the bank doesn't keep it the bank loans it out to somebody else uh, they make the difference between what they're paying you and what the the person is paying them and that's just you know wholesale money being sold for retail and just like any product in a grocery store is, they buy it wholesale, sell it for retail. Well, that's what banks do. And uh, these decentralized finance um, systems also do, and they work automatically. You deposit your money, you earn that automatic interest, they loan it out to other people, and it just churns. The money just churns back and forth, just like a bank would do it, only you've got code in the background. Uh, doing that so I hope this has helped I hope what what it means is that you're trusting the code instead of trusting a third-party intermediary and that's really what blockchain is going to do for us is it's going to allow us to move away from those third-party intermediaries that are expensive and take much more time to get a job done and having computer code do it which does it exceedingly faster and does it much more reliably and the same every time. All righty. So what I'd like you to do is make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and uh, we'll go on to our next subject.